DAX and AMS get a lot of hype. Companies like Topping and SMSL release a new product every few months, and the same reviewers start drooling over the specs and performance. The AMP or DAC they laud just a few months ago will be replaced by the newest iteration. It's tiring and frustrating to be told all the time that while the last product was the best ever, this one is now the mostest bestest ever. It's a never-ending cycle. Let's take back some of the power. Let's do our own tests. Let's not rely on those who don't bother to conduct true A-B examinations of products. And if it turns out in our tests that SMSL, Topping, and other brands are not releasing products materially different from previous generations, then we can choose not to buy them. Maybe that will force these companies to innovate and not regurgitate. In this series, I'm going to explain how you can at home conduct your own true A-B tests. Using the methods I propose, you can conduct these tests yourself, or you can turn them into blind tests by involving another person. Today, we're going to discuss how you can compare DACs. This video will be divided into three parts. Part 1 will discuss the components you need to build your own testing rig. Part 2 will discuss the methodology, the steps you should use to perform the tests. In Part 3, we will talk about some of the limitations in this type of A-B testing. For conducting true A-B tests with two or more DACs, you will need a few items. First, you will need a passive switch. You can choose to buy an XLR or RCA switch box. XLR switch boxes tend to be more expensive than RCA switch boxes. There is no difference in sound signature between balanced and single-ended output. So, my suggestion is that when you first start out with your rig, you limit your overall expense. Therefore, I encourage you to use a passive RCA switch box. It's less cumbersome, cheaper, and works for our testing purposes. You will need at least three RCA cables. Depending on the switch box you buy, you can try to test more than two DACs at a time. While theoretically possible, this can become a little bit unwieldy. I am going to promote that you test two DACs at a time, which will require you to have three sets of RCA cables. If you have these cables lying around, more the better. If you need to buy them, don't purchase cables that cost a lot of money. Monoprice and the dozen other knockoff brands on Amazon make good cables. It all probably comes from the same factory anyway. If you want to buy more expensive cables, well, that's up to you. You will need to have at least two USB cables compatible with your DAC. DACs usually come with these cables, so you shouldn't need to buy any more. You will need a PC. Our tests require a Windows computer. You will need to download Equalizer APO and Voice Meter Banana on your computer. You can pause this video and check out the ASR forum where this software is mentioned. There are precise instructions on how to use Voice Meter Banana on that forum. The link is in the description section below. You will also need to decide how you will test your music. I encourage you to create a playlist of songs you know and like. Get a variety of genres you tend to listen to. Your playlist can be 10, 20, 40, or 50 songs. It doesn't really matter. All that is required is that you get a fair sample of music that you enjoy. You can use songs ripped from a CD or a streaming service like Amazon Music or Spotify or Tidal or Cobus. You can buy high quality PCM digital files and use them if you want. Don't bother trying to conduct these tests using DSD files as Voice Meter Banana is limited to PCM. And I don't know if MQA is affected if it passes through Voice Meter before it hits your DAX. You will need headphones or IEMs. Don't buy new stuff for these tests. Use what you have and like. You will need a way to jot down your methodology, the steps you will follow so that you actually follow them. Whatever steps you choose, and we will talk about them in the next section, please follow them every time you conduct these tests. So before you start, make a plan. The total cost of these components is a whopping $23, not including tax and shipping. An RCA switch box will cost you around 13 bucks. The RCA cables I use are about 10 bucks. I already have the USB cables that came with the DAX. I already have a PC, headphones, and IEMs, so none of these are additional expensive. Voice Meter Banana is free. I have the links for all of these items in the description section below. Now that we know the components we need for an A-B testing rig, let's talk about the setup. Connect the DAX through their RCA output into the RCA switch, and then connect your amplifier through the RCA to the output of the switch box. 
connect your DAX to your PC. If your DAX have volume control, turn them up to max. You want to control volume from the amplifier. If for some reason there is a voltage difference between the two DACs, you can adjust the volume on the DAC that has the higher voltage. You shouldn't have an issue about this since all DACs I know of have about the same voltage from RCA. An alternative is to use the volume control built into Voice Meter Banana. Speaking of Voice Meter, follow the instructions on the ASR forum page to download and install the software. Connect your DACs to the PC before launching Voice Meter. The voice meter window will appear and may look imposing. Don't worry, we only need to make a few adjustments. First, go to your Windows audio settings. You might see two voice meter output options. Select the VAIO version. Now, Windows will send audio signal to voice meter and not to your DAX. Voice meter will control the audio path from there. Go back to the voice meter window. Go to the top right section. There are three drop down buttons. This is how you select your DAX. You might see your DAX listed as MME, ASIO, or WDM. These are just the various driver types. As far as I know, the major differences among them is their compatibility with the hardware and software on your PC and the latency. Sometimes one of these drivers will not play nicely with voice meter. You might not hear audio if you select one of these, or you might hear clipping. If either of this happens, just select a different available driver for your DAC. Remember, all of this should be selectable through Voice Meter's drop down menu. For me, sometimes ASIO works and sometimes I have to use MME. Whatever driver you use, try to use the same for both DACs. This might require some experimentation each time you launch Voice Meter, but once you get it set up for your devices, you won't have to keep messing with it. I have taken a screenshot of my setup. As you can see, I have already selected my DAC outputs. Take a close look at all other settings in this window, compare to yours, and make sure yours look identical other than the DAX of course. In the master section you can control volume for each DAC. This does come in handy when you're comparing dongle DACs that do not have volume control buttons. So if you compare the Dragonfly Cobalt to the EcoZerta, you can volume match using voice meter. Once voice meter is set up, launch your audio player. This should be Amazon Music, Spotify, Kobuz, Fubar, or anything else really. Do not launch these programs until after you have set up Voice Meter. Go to your audio program and select Voice Meter VAIO as the output. All audio signal will go directly to Voice Meter, and Voice Meter will then send it to both of your selected DACs at once. If you do not hear music, or if there's noise or clipping, go back to Voice Meter and try a different driver on the DAC drop down menu. And also, don't forget, maybe it's some of your connections, so try reconnecting. That's it. Now you're ready to test. You've got your components and set up Voice Meter correctly. Now let's talk about methodology. I'll tell you what I do. My first step when reviewing gear is to use the gear before conducting tests. I want to get to know the product. I want to know how it works and what its quirks are. Some reviewers seemingly pick up a product hours before they hit the record button on their GoPro and then waste time trying to figure out how the device they are actually reviewing functions. Uh, don't do that. I typically spend 30 days using a product before starting comparisons. Of course, if you are in a hurry and you have a return window, you can't spend that much time getting to know the device. But I do encourage you to spend at least a few days listening to and using the DAC before conducting the comparisons. Once I've spent time with the DAC, I connect it to my testing rig. I use my standard test playlist. I know these songs and theoretically, if there are audible differences between DACs, I should be able to recognize them because I know these songs. I spend 2-3 to three hours comparing with my test playlist and other random music. I constantly switch back and forth on the switch box. I listen for bass response, vocal presentation, and treble clarity. The goal is to figure out if there are audible differences between DACs. If I think I hear a difference, I write down what I think I heard. I then repeat the song. I listen closely for that type of difference in other songs. I make a note of whether or not that difference is heard again. I use different headphones throughout the testing process as I continue to repeat the tests. 
Usually, I use analytical headphones like the X55 or the X65, along with the HD6XX, the LCD-1, and anything else that might be within my reach. And there are a lot of headphones within my reach. I repeat all of these tests using a different amplifier. My testing process can take a few days, depending on how many times I want to repeat it. I try not to do it all in one sitting. I compare for about an hour, then take a short break, and then I listen for another hour before taking another break. My goal is to keep things as fair as I can. I do not want to skew the results either way. If I hear a difference, I do not jump to conclusions. I try to replicate those differences. If I do not hear a difference immediately, I don't stop the process. I keep going. I follow the same procedures every time I review a DAC. This is my methodology, and it works for me. You don't have to follow my process, but you should have a process nonetheless. Your methods should be repeatable. They should be simple. They should allow you to make specific, clear, unambiguous notes about what you are hearing or what you're not hearing. Avoid nonsensical terms like one DAC was more dynamic than another. Don't write that a DAC has a fuller sound than another. This is not specific. It is vague. You have the capacity to be clear about what you hear and what song you heard it on. If the guitar seems clearer on one DAC than another, write that down. Write down where in that song you think you heard it. Then come back to that song later and see if you can hear the difference again. This is testing and retesting to validate what you think you hear. Obviously, this is a lot of work. It's a lot of time. But you're spending hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars on DACs. A few hours of work doesn't really seem all that onerous. Above all, be honest. Be honest with yourself and with others. I would love all DACs to have a different sound signature. I have repeatedly complained that DACs have no variations, but I don't let my personal bias towards hoping there might be a difference cloud my conclusions. You don't have to use sound as the only reason to keep a DAC you like, by the way. If you bought a new topping or SMSL DAC and you discover through testing that it sounds identical to your older DAC, then you don't have to get disheartened. You can still choose to keep your new gear if you want. Recognizing that you just want something new, even if it doesn't do anything different, is a perfectly valid reason to keep it. Let's finish this up by talking about some of the limitations in the testing process. Foremost, the biggest limitation is us. We have to constantly fight against our own preconceptions and biases. But it is possible to be objective about what you hear. The process, once you agree to it, will force you to keep testing and retesting. But if your goal is to conclude there is a difference or there is not a difference, then you will actively work towards skewing the results. And that's not fair. So, no matter what you personally want the result to be, you will need to be honest about your findings. Legitimizing our findings requires us to be precise. We need to detail what we hear, when we hear it, what song we heard it on, whether we could replicate any differences later, and if the differences were apparent when using different headphones or after taking a break. This takes us to the second limitation. We cannot use words precisely enough to let someone else experience what we have experienced. They have to hear it themselves. But we can mitigate against nonsense. We have to stop using the typical audiophile jargon and useless vague commentary. Sound is not food. Something cannot sound chocolatey or gooey or sweet. Sound is not an emotion. Music can evoke emotional response, but that is entirely subjective. So sound isn't full-bodied or throaty. The bottom line is that we have to refrain from using language that is difficult to grasp and non-specific to what we actually heard. And even if we do the best job possible to convey precise explanations, it's a far cry from someone hearing it themselves. The next limitation might be your setup. You don't need to buy expensive components to do an A-B test, but some components might be faulty. You will need to watch out for loose connections and driver compatibility. Every once in a while, someone might tell you that you should use high-end gear for a valid test. That is bogus. You don't need a $1,000 DAC or the HD800S or a handmade amplifier for your test to be reliable. 
you also don't need to buy neutral headphones to conduct these tests. When you first start out, use the gear you already have. Don't spend money where you don't have to. But you should be familiar with your gear. I'm sure there are other issues someone could point to, legitimate or not. The goal is to keep things simple so that tests can be repeatable. Always be willing to consider if you can improve your methods. You might not be able to. After all, we all have financial and time constraints. But if you think adding another step in the process or taking one step out might help, then don't be afraid to give that a shot. Keep in mind that you might get lots of feedback from people who tell you about your setup. Some of it might be helpful and some of it won't be. As long as you can justify logically why you did what you did, then you've done a valid test as far as I'm concerned. Ultimately, I want people to do their own A-B tests. I want you all to have a simple testing rig. I want you to confidently check what you hear against what the typical reviewers and extremophiles keep regurgitating. If it turns out that next month's newest SMSL or topping DAC sounds the same as the one you bought two years ago, then you can choose to return the new one. And that's the power we should all have. The more of us who do true A-B tests, the less influenced reviewers, the emotionally influenced, and the measureholics will have over the community. If we want manufacturers to stop dumping copy and paste products, if we want more meaningful reviews, and if we want to be smarter with our money, then we need to do our own reliable tests. This is my way of offering a solution. If you want to give it a try, then it's about 25 bucks investment with several hours of sometimes tedious but necessary work.